Hello, my name is Nick Awai Jin. I'm a game designer at that game company. And today I'm going to talk to you all about cognitive maps and how to prevent your players from getting lost uh, in your levels. So as I said, I'm a game designer at that game company, but before I was a game designer, I was actually in architecture. And so a lot of the references and imagery um, and knowledge that I'll be using in this presentation actually come from the domains of architecture and urban planning. One of my big interests has always been wayfinding and navigation, which is how we get here. So we're gonna jump right in and let's first start by defining what maps are. So firstly, a map is a tool. A map helps you achieve something. Most of the time it's orienting yourself in relation to other things. Uh, a map is made. So I can't go out into nature and find a map just sitting there on the ground. It's either made by me or by somebody else. It represents spaces or concepts. It's pretty self-explanatory and it's relational. So if I show you a piece of paper and it's got a dot on it, and that dot is labeled Paris, that isn't a map just yet. However, if I show you that same piece of paper with a dot that says Paris, and another dot that says Cairo, now we're beginning to form a map, and, and those two dots can begin to anchor each other in space. Also, a map has edges or limits. Uh, even if it's a globe, which is a map of the entire Earth, you're going to be limited by how much information you can get at particular scales, etc. Uh, there are a couple things maps aren't. So maps aren't, quote, the truth. Uh, they are not always orthographic. So uh, that kind of top-down view of something without any perspective that we associate with maps, um, maps don't always have to be that. Uh, they're not always flat. That uh, Polynesian stick chart that I'm showing on the top right is an example of a kind of three-dimensional, uh, very tactile map that maps ocean swells and islands to help uh, navigators navigate wide expanses of ocean, for example. Um, they're, always not, they're also not always physical, which means that they can take place in our minds, which is, as you guessed, what a cognitive map is, uh, and it's prescriptive. So... If I show you a map of a part of the world that you're unfamiliar with and I label something incorrectly, as far as you're concerned, that's, that incorrect label is, is reality to you. So let's talk about cognitive, cognitive mapping. This term was originally coined uh, by Edward Tolman in his lab in 1948. So if you've seen imagery of rats in uh, a maze running around trying to get a piece of cheese, that's where this is where it comes from. So the experiment was as follows. They would take a rat and place a rat in the apparatus that you see on the top left, in this kind of circular room, and they would hide a piece of cheese where that letter G is located in that yellow diamond. And the rat would eventually find that piece of cheese. And then once consumed, it would, uh, once the cheese was consumed, they would put the rat back in the circle um, and have the rat do this over and over until it was almost like muscle memory. You know, the rat would go in, it knew exactly what routes to take and it would get the cheese. Then they would take that same rat and put it in the apparatus that you see in the middle. So it's that same kind of rounded room, but that original pathway was now blocked. The uh, researchers wanted to know, would the rat, once it realizes that path is blocked, uh, have some sort of intuition as to where this piece of cheese was? And if it did, it would probably bias uh, channel six, um, which is geographically where you would go if you just wanted to get the cheese. But if it didn't, we would, ex if the rat didn't have a kind of understanding of what its world was in its own mind, it would just bias all of the paths equally. And as uh, the researchers and Tolman found out, um, rats did create some sort of mental map of their environment. As you can see on the bar on the right hand side, that really tall, um, that really tall bar is uh, how many times those rats picked uh, Avenue Six. So that is uh, <coughs> what these cognitive maps are for rats. But of course, we're not rats. We are people, uh, we have our own people brains and uh, we inhabit non-trivial spaces. We live in cities, suburbs, uh, all, all, all kinds of different environments that demand us to use our own cognitive maps on a daily basis. So we can do a little exercise um, to help you understand what your own cognitive map is like. So uh, 
Take five minutes and draw your neighborhood from memory on a piece of paper. Don't look anything up. Just try to just try to let your uh, your mind guide your hand and just spend five minutes to do that. So if you want to do that exercise, go ahead and pause the video now. If you've done that exercise, you might have a drawing similar to the illustrations we see here on the top. Um, these illustrations actually came from uh, the Image of the City, which is a book that urbanist Kevin Lynch uh, published and. Kevin Lynch went to a bunch of cities and asked people to do this very same thing. Hey, can you draw me your neighborhoods? And after uh, parsing through all of those different illustrations, he was able to discern uh, five elements that people use to make sense of the spaces around them. Paths, landmarks, districts, edges, and notes. The rest of this talk is going to explain each one of these elements in detail and how we can use those to make really strong, cohesive cognitive maps. But of course, this talk is also about not getting lost, so we need to explain what getting lost is. Now that we have a clear idea of a cognitive map, getting lost is simply a misalignment of your cognitive map with what the world around you is, with your surroundings. It's that feeling of uh, feeling like an area or a space is new, but knowing for a fact that it isn't, uh, and it's generally a bad time. This can result from changes in your environment or changes in your place within the environment, um, or it can result from insufficiently broad or uh, insufficiently clear cognitive maps uh, because you're unable to respond to those changes in an adequate way. Similar to this image, uh, which is a map of the world. You know, it's upside down. We might be able to tell it's a map of the world, but you know, I'd be really hard pressed to identify uh, any particular country with the map upside down. So let's talk about the first element. Uh, the first are paths. This is also the most self-explanatory element. It's a linear space that directs movement and travel. Uh, and it also tends to be dominant in cognitive maps. If you did the exercise earlier, one of the first things you might have done was uh, started diagramming all of the paths that uh, you are aware uh, in your neighborhood. And these are things like sidewalks, streets, trails, etc. Travel tends to be concentrated on them, and because of that, we tend to treat them differently. You know, we pave our roads, uh, we cut channels to make sure that water can flow through correctly, that sort of thing. And interestingly enough, paths are the most temporal element. So uh, a path isn't useful to you if you're not, you know, moving along it, and moving along that is an, moving along a path is inherently tied to time. Uh, and so that process of uh, incrementing your way along a path is what Lynch called scaling. Uh, there are a few limitations, though, when we're dealing with paths. Uh, we kind of digest them and use them in two, two ways. Uh, one is dead reckoning and the other is path integration. And they're technically different, but for the sake of this presentation, we can just think about both of these concepts as knowledge that where I am now is where I was previously, plus all of the steps that I took uh, since that last reference point. Uh, this relies on uh, continuity, uh, proprioception, or you know, a, a good understanding of your own body and its movement throughout spaces, a calculation, intuition, etc. cetera. Um, however, it can be difficult or impossible um, to uh, properly utilize a, a, a map using, using these techniques um, without knowledge of those things. And a lot of times in games in particular, you know, I might not be fully uh, aware of the movement mechanics. Uh, I might not be fully aware of um, how, uh, how the camera or the player or what have you that I'm controlling can experience that space. And so my sense of proprioception there is really limited. So we should keep that in mind when we're using paths. So how can they help us, you know, prevent players from getting lost? Uh, paths are really good at catching lost players. Uh, you can think of, you know, being lost in a desert. If you're lost in a desert, uh, you really just need to pick a direction and start walking because you don't know where to go. But once you come across a path or a street, you've automatically eliminated one vector um, from your field of possibilities. So now you either, you just have to choose, am I gonna go left or am I gonna go right? So having a path is a really good way to catch players who uh, might be deviating away and, and starting to get lost. Obviously, paths also do great level design things like establishing player flow and connecting large areas together, et cetera. 
Inadequate pathing in your space can make it difficult to connect areas of the cognitive map together. And we have those limitations from dead reckoning and path integration that manifest, that manifest themselves even more in games. One of the things to look out for as well with paths is that uh, moving one way along a path does not necessarily mean uh, moving the other way. If you've had the experience of going on a hike, reaching the end destination, turning around and going back and not being fully sure if you're going down the same trail, um, you've experienced this. So just because you've placed paths inside of your level doesn't automatically mean that players suddenly won't get lost. You need to make sure that you're addressing that concern as well. The next element are landmarks, also super self-explanatory and loved by level designers all over the place. Uh, there are single, localized, and memorable features. You know, paths were these linear elements. Now we've got point references with these landmarks. They tend to be things you want to take pictures of, um, and they're recognizable either visually, <coughs> excuse me, narratively or experientially. You know, it can be this uh, Randy's Donuts shop, or it could be the bench that the character had their first kiss in, for example. Uh, landmarks can be useful in a number of different ways. Uh, one of those is orienting players from a distance. A lot of the times, landmarks uh, uh, are tall, and so you can see them from far away, which is great. Um, but they're also useful for orienting players when they're going down new paths and new journeys. So. If I'm going to an area that I haven't been to before, but I maintain a reference point in a previous landmark that I've already established, that'll help anchor the new information that I'm receiving in relation to that previous landmark. Also, they tend to situate elements of, this, uh, of, the, uh, of your spaces um, among themselves, which is super important. But also to note, Landmarks are essentially only useful if they're stationary. So if you've got a large creature, let's say, that is walking around a big map, um, that creature is no longer that useful as a landmark because it's moving all the time. Also, uh, they're much better when they're directional. So I have this Statue of Liberty here on the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower is uh, radially symmetric. So if I'm north of the Eiffel Tower looking back or I'm south of the Eiffel Tower looking back, the Eiffel Tower is basically going to look the same to me. But if I'm north of the Statue of Liberty and I'm south of the Statue of Liberty, the way that the Statue of Liberty is made makes it very easy for me to discern that, hey, I'm in a different spot now. So whenever you can, if, uh, you know, making sure that uh, people can use that landmark to situate themselves around it is important to you, uh, try to make your, your landmarks directional. Lastly, uh, Photogrammetry is the process of taking multiple pictures of an object and then making a 3D model from that. You wanna think of your landmarks in a similar way. If a landmark is only referenced one time, it's not really gonna be useful for the, the player to create their own cognitive map. Uh, you wanna make sure they're able to reference it as many times as possible so that that reference point can be continually reinforced. Next up, we have districts. Uh, this is also self-explanatory. A district is a region identified by a characteristic or quality, and we have uh, point references with landmarks, linear references with paths, and now we've got these zonal references with districts. Here are a bunch of examples, industrial zones, downtowns, nature preserves, etc. A good way to identify districts is to do what I call the squint test. So if you look at your map and you squint your eyes and everything gets all blurry, if you can start to distinguish different parts of that map, you know, like this area is a little red, this area is, you know, looking a little different, um, you can most of the time assume that those are your districts. Um, the districts have edges um, and you go through them. So you enter into these uh, new kinds of spaces. They tend to be mid to large scale. And another good way of thinking about districts is a color by number image. So uh, a color by number image is a kind of cohesive and consistent uh, portrait as a whole, but it's comprised of these uh, unique and recognizable uh, colors uh, that work together to make it all work out. Likewise, in our cognitive maps, having clear districts really helps to differentiate areas from each other. An important thing with districts is the concept of clustering. So I have two clusters here. I've got a set of five clusters on the left and a set of five clusters on the right. And the set of clusters that are on the left are way easier to remember than the ones on the right. And that's because they are grouped with like objects. Um, 
<laughs> this type of clustering can be semantic or mechanical, not just visual. So, you know, it doesn't that just have to be, you know, three pyramids here and three box buildings over here. It can be, you know, this is an area that I uh, can jump really high. This is an area where I get in cars and drive around, etc. Isolating these uh, these qualities in different areas like this is, is just generally good practice for world building and game design. Um, but it really helps reinforce a cognitive map because I could probably navigate away from this slide. And because they're clustered in such a way, the image on the left might still be something you remember. Whereas the image on the right, you might forget the moment that I move away from it. Uh, second to last, we have edges. So an edge is a linear reference, uh, but it's not a path. These tend to control continuity or they separate things. Examples are gates, walls, cliffs, borderlines, etc. And they tend to be elevational simply because we tend to move around the world horizontally. So if we were, if we, you know, flew around a lot or climbed a lot of trees, uh, edges could be barriers that are horizontal, but most of the time, uh, they're vertical things. It's stuff that you tend to go around or go along or things that you, also, you go through. For example, being on the outside of a building, opening a door and entering inside of that building. You wanna be deliberate when you're working with paths. You know, crossing that threshold of a path or being, uh, uh, sorry, of an edge, uh, crossing that threshold of the edge and, um, or being blocked by the edge are, are, are really memorable experiences if that edge is really crisp and clean. Uh, I notice that sometimes we have this tendency to to want to blur things like we don't want these like hard, uh, hard lines cutting through our landscapes. And um, this isn't to say that you need to make hard lines, but uh, you should be deliberate in uh, the limits and boundaries of these districts um, in the form of these edges, because if the edges are blurred, the cognitive map of players is also going to reflect that blurred nature and it's not going to be as good at uh, anchoring them when, when they do start getting lost. Uh, these occur a lot in games. There's level transitions, level boundaries, mechanical boundaries, portals, ledges, walls, cliffs, etc. cetera. Um, so we have plenty of opportunity to liberally use edges and we want to take full advantage of those. And lastly, we have nodes. So a, no a node is a, a convergence of paths. It's a point reference, but uh, it's a point reference that is defined by paths, which is the other element. Most of the time, these are things like traffic intersections, transit hubs, or home spaces or hub spaces that allow you to access multiple different locations of the game from, uh, from one spot. If there is a place that has many ins or many outs, that's usually a node. Um, they tend to be denser uh, than the adjacent areas just because you know these are places that players and people flock to when they're uh, navigating in general. So they're good to have. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You know, there's that expression: all load, all roads lead to Rome. Um, and in this example, Rome is a node. Having uh, having a location that is repeatedly used by people on their way to get somewhere is really important and really valuable. So when you're making a node or when you've recognized that you have created a node in a game that you're working on, you really wanna start working on placemaking there in order to, to make it as recognizable as possible. These nodes can be destinations. They don't just have to be things that you go in or go through. And a good way to, to facilitate that is just make sure that people can spend some time there as opposed to just, you know, be transient and move, move through something. I've been on plenty highway intersections, uh, having grown up my whole life in LA. Uh, but if you were to drop me in one of these big highway interchanges, uh, I might be hard pressed to know where I am without all, without all the signage. So uh, if you want, if you're going to make a node, uh, try to turn it into a place and not just some, you know, arbitrary thing you pass through. So those are the five elements, you know, what they are, how you can identify them, how you can leverage them and why they're useful. Um, but now let's talk about more specifically implementing them in our design practice. So the first thing I like to do is do an audit, try to look at levels and spaces that I've already made and identify existing paths, landmarks, districts, edges, and nodes in those areas. 
Then once I've done that, I want to assess the clarity and readability of those things. If I'm kind of doing this audit and then I'm saying that could be a landmark or that looks like a good enough district, et cetera, it probably isn't a good enough landmark and it probably isn't a district. So that's a key for me to go back and, uh, you know, clarify those things, you know, really, uh, really not be shy about these design decisions that I'm making. Uh, then I want to organize uh, my, my space. So I tend to work because of the architectural background. Uh, I like to work in plan first. And I like to think of plan as the organization or structure for everything. Uh, I think the plan should be clear and legible. And by looking at that plan, uh, you should be able to easily recognize almost all of these elements there. Once the plan kind of really pops with all of these elements and, and the really distinct, uh, then I like to move on to section. And section is where I think the emotion comes out, where the storytelling happens, where the experience really takes place. Just because I've got, you know, one of these elements in my plan, it doesn't mean it's actually going to come through in my section when I'm experiencing the game. So if I see on my plan, there's this really strong landmark, but then when I start playing the game, that landmark isn't really reading. That's a key to me to go back and, and edit that landmark to make sure that it's legible uh, when I'm playing the game. Speaking of playing the game, it's super important to test if you can without a HUD or a mini map or UI, et cetera. Why is this? A uh, couple of things. Uh, using tools like a radar, GPS, or a mini map uh, can lead us into digesting spaces using an egocentric frame of reference as opposed to an allocentric frame of reference. So what do these mean? Uh, egocentric frame of reference means I'm the center of the universe and the universe kind of revolves around me as I go through it. If you've used a GPS navigation system on your phone, um, that's egocentric. Um, this can be difficult because you're navigating in this piecemeal fashion where you're primarily focused on what your next maneuver is going to be. You know, I need to turn right in 500 feet and turn left, et cetera. Um, and breaking down the journey in that way uh, has been shown to result in a decrease in route memory. It can also disengage you from the environment because you're exploring the, uh, the map or the UI or the HUD instead of the space itself. What you're trying to do is actually take that triangle and move it to that circle and your character moving through the world is just a byproduct of you trying to get those shapes um, to align. However, if you test without the aid of a heads-up display, et cetera, um, you tend to do more allocentric uh, uh, mapping. Allocentric mapping is I am not the center of the world. The world exists and I am simply moving through it. It's this kind of big picture navigation. And when you, when you do things this way, uh, there tends to be an increase in route memory. Uh, you're engaged more with your environment and you're exploring the space instead of just exploring the map itself. I have this uh, image here of the fish in the lake and the bird in the trees. So the fish in the lake can see the bird in the trees uh, and it can see the trees, but it can't see the lake because that's that's where it is. Likewise, the bird can identify the fish and the lake, but not the forest uh, because it's look, understanding things egocentrically. What we want to do to get a clear picture of everything is, is try to get what the image in the center is, which is essentially uh, an allocentric frame of reference, which is, you know, this is the environment and the player is uh, simply moving through the environment. So... The TLDR of this talk is one, there exist things called cognitive maps. It is the digestion of uh, the environments that you go through that uh, exist in everybody's head. Getting lost is when that cognitive map is misaligned with uh, the environment, uh, with, is misaligned with what the environment is currently telling you. So how can we, how can we prevent players from getting lost? Well, we can try to foster clearer cognitive maps. And how can we do that? We can use a toolkit uh, using paths, landmarks, districts, edges, and nodes to make sure that our spaces are robust and can actually foster uh, these robust cognitive maps. And a good way to do that is just be deliberate. I've included this uh, lovely uh, food tray here because uh, I could take the same food tray with all of those same ingredients and just kind of like mix it all up in there and so everything's, you know, all up on top of each other and, and blended. Um, 
but it, it wouldn't be as appetizing, first of all. And secondly, uh, it, it wouldn't be as memorable to me. <coughs> Excuse me. It would have the same nutritional value, but by virtue of the way it's organized, it's, it's not going to read as clearly. And with this one, you know, I can do my squint tests, you know, and, and I can begin to start making out districts. I can kind of start to make out landmarks, even with this food. So uh, you can really apply these design strategies to nearly everything. Lastly, I wanted to uh, just show you uh, all of these different references that I have used and to, to try to, you know, understand these things for myself. Um, these are all people who are way more intelligent than I am. And if you're interested in pursuing this topic further, I would encourage you to go here. Um, here are a bunch of more names uh, <laughs> that you should uh, continue to take a look at. Go ahead and pause the video. Uh, and any one of these is going to be uh, an exciting uh, paper for you to enjoy. So I will go back. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I hope that uh, this uh, helped enlighten you and helped you understand uh, how to uh, prevent your players from getting lost and introduced a new paradigm uh, for understanding how you can design your levels specifically for that use case. Uh, my name is Nick Awajin. I hope you have a great day and that's it. Thank you so much. All right. Bye.